Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Why don't you stand with us? Let's begin worship this morning. Sing a wonderful hymn we all know here at First Baptist. Let's sing When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love. to see you out this morning praise the lord this morning praise him you know i hope i hope we are all going to heaven but there's a reality some of us might not be just singing a song or someone even saying some nice words at your funeral does not mean you're going to heaven amen it has to be a relationship with the lord but those of us that are we don't have to wait till we get there to begin worship amen so this morning let's continue in worship Let's sing this beautiful song, Yes I Will. Let's begin worship even here and today as we're joined together. Sing, Yes I Will. Praise His name. I count on one thing. Blessing God that never fails will not fail me now. He will fail me now in the waiting. Blessing God working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy.
morning, church. As we continue in worship, I would love to share a scripture this morning out of Revelation chapter 5. Listen to these words. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And in verse 9, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Amen. Feel the world is broken. We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he 
echo the words of the song you are worthy father forgive us that sometimes we fail to give you the honor and the glory that you're due even the most mundane things of our life but father this morning with our hearts our minds our souls and with our voices we proclaim that you are worthy father I pray that during this time Lord through everything single thing that's happened that you are brought honor and by the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, through the word that's spoken and preached by our pastor this morning that you've given to him this week. Father, may everything, every breath in this place give you honor and glory. In your name we pray and ask. Amen. You can be seen. Well, good morning, church. We are, he is so worthy. He's worthy of everything. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our success. He's worthy of our money. He's worthy of everything. And that's what we were teaching this week in Arizona. We just got back from a mission trip. Uh, we took native students uh, from the Teo Nation and the Pima Nation and Congolese refugees. We had uh, students from all over and took them to this mountain. We're praising God. And what we were teaching them and our Bible study is that he is worthy of everything and to really count the cost of what it means to follow Christ. And we had seven uh, people give their life to Christ at camp this week. So it was a very successful time. I do want to welcome you here. If you're a guest with us, uh, we are glad you're here. We know there are plenty of places uh, that you could choose to go worship. So we are glad that you are with us. Uh, at this time, I do want to dismiss, so I don't forget, our children to Children's Church, kindergarten through fourth grade. You got to get out of here before Wes gets up here. So if you will follow Miss Crystal out the door there. Right. They're running out. They're gone. So we do take uh, a lot of time and effort and stuff with Arizona and pouring into the students there. We have a lot of time and effort that we pour into our students here. And this week we do have our VBS uh, where we will be at Central Elementary. We will start tomorrow through Thursday. There's a lot of planning and things that go on with that. So please be praying for VBS. And then we also have a mission team from Valdosta, Georgia that will be joining, joining us. They're coming in tonight. Uh, we're going to meet them tonight, and then they are also going to be helping with our VBS. And then we are throwing two block parties. We've identified two neighborhoods that we want to throw a block party in. And so we are going to go to those neighborhoods, have like a little block party and mini VBS, kind of a condensed version. So if you would like to help with that, please get in contact with the church office. Uh, we do need some uh, hands there and some help. So if you would like to help with this, we're going to target the neighborhoods and kind of give out all the information on Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday we're going to have a block party. So we would love your help with that. And then we also have kids camp July 27th through the 31st. If you have a child who is entering into the third grade through the sixth grade and would like to go, we're going to crossings at Jonathan Creek. Please sign up by this Friday. I think the cost is uh, $272 and you can give with that via text to give. So it's text FBC Mayfield to 7 three, two, five, six, and just give through that. That's probably the easiest way. Uh, if you, your tithes and offering can also go through that text to give number. We also have drop boxes out each door, or you can give by mail. We do have a new address, 100 WKNT Technology Drive, building 1100, and that's Mayfield, Kentucky. That is also where our church office is, so if you do need to stop by, please come see us there. Uh, as Wes prepares to come up, let me pray for us. And just praise God for what we have seen him do this past week in Arizona. Father, we love you. And God, you are worthy 
of everything. As Paul was reading Revelation 5, I was just reminded of just that beautiful, beautiful picture of the throne of God and from people from every tribe, nation, and tongue surrounded around the throne singing praise to you. It's shown in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7, God, of just people praising you. And I pray that we would honor you the way, you're, the way you deserve to be honored, that you, we would humble ourselves before the throne of God and sing praises to you. I pray that we do that in our worship. I pray that we do that uh, through your word. And I pray for Wes as he brings his message that we would just consider the cost Consider what it means to truly follow you and really look at our lives and say, am I giving Christ everything? Is he the center of my life? Am I willing to give it up, give up everything to follow him? God, be with us during this time of worship. Be with Wes as he delivers your word. Give him the boldness and the strength uh, to deliver your word and your message faithfully. God, we love you and we praise you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Blake. Turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter 10. We'll be there shortly. We did have a, a great trip to, uh, to Arizona. Uh, I came home with a little hair on my face. Didn't shave all week while I was there and walked in the door and, and uh, said, Tara Brooke, what do you think about that? She said, it's going to have to grow on me. <laughs> and I said, well, literally, it's going to have to grow on me. You know? but, uh, I have a, a feeling that it won't be here very long. I, I call this my, my mission trip look, though. And, uh, I, I will tell you that those of you who help us with Arizona, those of you who have been there, you know it is a special place. It is a special trip, and those are very special uh, kids. I believe we had 85 students and then 38 adults helping us out for a total of 123 people up on top of this, this mountain. We added a day this year, so that was unique for us. Usually we start on a Sunday. We get up to the top of the mountain on a Sunday, uh, Sunday late, late Sunday afternoon, even evening, and then we start the camp on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we start heading back down on Thursday. Well, this week we got there on Saturday, got there a day early, and we started the camp on Sunday and went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, added a whole extra day for them. Um, and I'll tell you what, they, they loved it. Uh, number one, we got some extra time of discipleship with them. But I want to tell you what I really heard. When I, I, I asked all the students I would, that I had in, in my group and others, that I, hey, you like this extra day? You like this? And a lot of them don't have uh, the best home life to go home to. And so us having them at camp an extra day gives them an extra day to relax and get three good meals and be around people that love them and, and care about them and just let them relax. So the extra day was, is definitely worth it in my opinion. Uh, I've had a few people ask me, we didn't do sponsorships this year for, for Arizona. Well, you're welcome to, to sponsor someone for Arizona. Here's basically the, the church budget. We're in good shape there. We have uh, used the, the resources that we already have in our budget that you have tithed, that you have, have given, and we've, we've put that towards this trip. Obviously, if somebody wants to make a, a special donation for Arizona, it would go towards that, and then the funds that we were going to use from our budget would just go towards something else here in, in Mayfield. But you've been generous, and you've been good. If there's anything that we're going to use our church budget for, shouldn't it be to reach people who don't know the gospel? I mean, a camp like this is exactly what that can go towards, and we can all feel really good about it. And so that's kind of what we've done this, uh, this year. Uh, Mark chapter 10, life's primary question. Mark chapter 10. Now, we've been here over the years before. I like this text. We've been here uh, probably twice since I've been here, and it's since 2011. Uh, even before that, I, I, I've got my records. I've preached in this text several times. Uh, either out of Mark or Matthew or, or, or Luke, not in John. But um, this, this text is one that we covered this past week in Arizona. Um, and by the way, the last time I preached two weeks ago um, about uh, foxes have holes, uh, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no... That was, that was one of our texts for Arizona as well. So these are the texts that have been on my mind. I'm not good at just coming up with a random text for the day. Like... It's got to be on my mind. It's got to be what I've been thinking about. And then I try to bring it before you. And so this text has been on my mind, on my heart lately. I want you to know this, by the way. So day one of discipleship in Arizona, you got to hear this. Because we had you know, seven professions of faith. So day one was 
Foxes have hoes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And then somebody else was wanting to follow Jesus, and, and then the, he said, let me go, let me go bury my, my, my father. And then somebody else said, I want to follow you, but let me go say bye to my family first. And Jesus said, you know, if you turn away while you're plowing, you're not even worthy of, of the kingdom of, of, of heaven. And so that was our first text, talking about three people who basically said no to Jesus. And we talked about the cost of following Jesus, what this means. You might be uncomfortable. You might have to put something else as the priority. In fact, you will have to put something else as, as the priority. You have to devote your whole life to this man that we call Jesus, who is the Savior of the world. you got to put your, that was day one. And so these students who don't know much about Jesus are like, my goodness, you know, that's pretty heavy. And day, day two, I'm trying to think, that actually might have been day, day two. Day one, I think, was this text, the rich young ruler, who Jesus said, you got to go sell all your possessions, give everything away, and then come and follow me. And the man walked away disappointed and sad because he had great wealth. So we spent two days talking about people who came to Jesus and seemingly wanted to follow them, but they turned away because the cost was too high. We didn't paint an easy gospel for these kids. We didn't say, man, just come and he'll love you and you live the way you want to live and don't worry about it. No, we said there's a cost. It's, it costs you everything. It costs your whole life. Then day three was when we turned to the disciples and we talked about, about how Jesus came to the disciples and said, come and follow, follow me. And they had to leave their boats and they had to leave their, their nets, and they had to leave their father. They had to leave their occupation, which was their income, which greatly affected their family. We, we painted a difficult picture for these kids. Because I don't like easy beliefism. Um, by the way, is Kathy Matheny here by chance this morning? Oh, Jackie is going through a lot right now. But uh, I use Jackie Matheny as an example. They'll get a kick out of this. I remember one time, as one of our deacons, Jackie, was leading the devotion, and he got to that text about the disciples leaving their nets and their boats and their father and all this, and, and Jackie was just overwhelmed one time. If some of you might have been there. I think it was a Wednesday night prayer meeting. He was talking about this, and he, he said, you know what? I, I know I know that they, they love Jesus. I know that they, I mean, they were going to give their all to follow Jesus because they, goodness, they left their boat. And... <clears throat> And he just couldn't imagine. <laughs> you're serious if you're leaving your boat. In Graves County, you got a nice boat. You know, you're, you're serious if you're going to follow this man and leave your boat behind. We painted a tough, a tough picture. But we talked about what do you get for following Jesus. I mean, you might have to give up quite a bit in this life, but, but you've got eternal life. I mean, yes, you might have to sacrifice and, and do things for 80 years of your life or 100 years of your life here, here on earth. And this might be difficult, and you might be persecuted, and you might suffer, but, but you have eternal life, and this never ends. That's the picture that we painted this week, and seven people said, that's what I want, because I believe he's the Christ. And so this morning, I want us to look at this text again, life's primary question. I believe we encounter life's primary question as we, as we read this. Look with me, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a, a man ran up and he knelt before him. Remember, remember that, he knelt before him. And he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice the title of the sermon, life's primary question. I think that's it. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, by the way, those are from the Ten Commandments. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my, from my youth. What an answer. I've kept all of them. And Jesus, looking at him, he loved him. Remember that. Loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And we'll keep reading just for a second. 
Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Is he talking to us today? I don't think you're convinced. Is he talking to us today? Do you realize that if you're in this room today, you would likely be considered what? Wealthy. Now, I know some of you don't, you're not going to leave here thinking, I'm wealthy. You're wealthy compared to the rest of the world. There's no doubt about it. He's talking to us. How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Anybody want to tell me real quick? When you have wealth, what do you trust more, your wealth or God? That's right. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, talking to his disciples, I love that. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Of God. Don't tell me Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor. Because they were picturing this. It's easier for a camel to go through the... That's impossible. In fact, that's what they said. Look at verse 26. And they were exceedingly astonished. And they said to him, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's actually impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. With God, can you be saved? Yes or no? You can. Let's evaluate this text this morning a little bit. Number one, as I read through this, I want you to know this. This is not just a good question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not just a good question. It's what? It's the question. From the text, we know this young man was probably some kind of prominent official. He was wealthy. Matthew mentions that he had great wealth. Luke identifies him as a ruler. So sometimes he's called the rich, young, what? Ruler. That's what he's referred to oftentimes as despite all of his financial blessings and despite his place in society. What's the one thing you wanted to know about? How to get to heaven. That's right. How do I have eternal life? How many times do we see this, by the way? People can buy every house they want to buy, every car they want to drive, all the clothes they want to have in Hollywood. I was just out there a few weeks ago, by the way. I fit right in. How, how many people are out there living in these multi-million dollar homes and on TV and movies and whatever you have it, all this stuff, but they're miserable? How many people? Quite a few. Quite a few. And this man kind of fits into that category. He's got everything that life can offer him, but he's got this question, what do I do to have eternal life? Because here's what you know. I've, I've learned this myself as I've gotten older and, and just, you know, I've, I've told you stories before where when I, I think when I was in my 20s, I'm like, man, if I could ever have, have X, Y, or Z, whatever this is, a certain vehicle or a certain house or whatever, if I could just have that, man, that would, I would feel pretty fulfilled if I could just have that. Well, you know, and some of you know this, you get to a place in life where you can have X, Y, or Z, and then you get X, Y, or Z, and it's not that big of a deal. It's not really that special. Feels good for a little bit, but then it's just a thing. Not sufficient. He wanted to know about eternal life. This is the question. We're only here for 80, 90, 100. We've had some here at 105, I think. Uh, what comes next? In my notes, I wrote down this question. Isn't death the great equalizer of all of us. I've said this before, and I want you to hear this. I want you to remember this. The mortality rate, as of yesterday, is 100%. Ain't nobody getting out of here alive, okay? Unless the Lord comes back and takes us, right? That's, that's about the only other option. Even if we don't like to talk about it very much, we all know that we're going to what? It's true. Uncomfortable? Yes. One day, though, people will come to your what? Funeral. They, they will. I don't even like to think about it, but 
I mean, you could very well, people in this room could one day attend my funeral. It's just reality. Like, death is a fact of what? Life. Eternity's crossed all of our, our minds, regardless of your race, whether you're male or female, educated or uneducated, rich or poor, lost or saved, young or old, regardless of nationality. All humans think about death, and all of humanity will face eternity. If I get everything else wrong today, I got that one right. We're going to face eternity somewhere. I've used this example before, but I, I like it because I can just I can visualize it so clearly. I see John Davis back there. Uh, I know, John, you were good friends with Bill Penner. Right? Yeah, he's kind of, I guess, sort of no. But uh, Bill Penner, church member a long time ago, and, and he, he was passing away. My goodness, he probably wasn't in his late 60s, 70s, I don't know. I mean, wasn't that, that old of a, a gentleman. But he worked with our sound. He loved our sound. Everything's sound. He would ask for, we need better speakers. We need better mics. We need better, I mean, he was, he was a sound guy. He wanted it to sound perfect. And then he found out that some kind of sickness uh, he was going to pass away. And I, I remember it because he, he came into my office and he just kind of sat down. He scheduled an appointment and then he just, he just sat, sat down and he said, Preacher, I just want you to know i got less than six months to live. I said, well, how are you doing today? That's basically how he started the conversation. He said something to the effect, I'm, I'm dying soon and I want to talk about it. And when he told me that he was going to be dying soon, we just kind of sat there in some awkwardness because it's not a comfortable thing to talk about. But he wasn't nervous about it at all. He knew it was coming. The doctor said, you're not going to make it through. This is happening. So he wanted to talk about, I want to make sure that my salvation is right. We talked about eternity. We talked about the gospel. He said, I want to make sure, here's what I'd like at my, at my, my funeral. But what I remember about that moment is you're literally in the room talking to somebody that knows within a month or two that they're not going to be here on this earth anymore, that they will for sure be in eternity, that they're going to be there. They're going to face what you and I think about, what you and I can't know until we get there, but somebody, in the, they know it's coming. There's no doubt about it. They just wanted clarity on the gospel and on their service. And of course, he approached it. If you know Bill Penner, he, he approached it in a very humorous way. And pass away, he did. And we had his funeral just the way he wanted us to. See, Miss Lee Ann, I remember talking to Juanita. I, th- yeah, I had her on my mind as I was thinking about this. As I was right by her bedside, I remember Miss Juanita Watts. Remember Miss Ma- Juanita Watts? She's a precious person. I remember her saying, Wes, I've got, I've got cancer, and they tell me that I'm dying. I mean, she said, I don't feel like I'm dying right now, but they tell me that I, that I am. They, they tell me that it's, it's coming, and it was. And it was. And we talked about her life, and we talked about how much she loved life, and we talked about just all kinds of good things in that, in that moment. Eternity is a reality. So this guy didn't just ask a good question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked what? This is the question for all of us in here. You need to get this right. Number two, let's talk about uh, his, his response to Jesus. I would say this, it's not just a bad response, it's pretty much the worst response. That's where I want us to go. It's not just a bad response, it was pretty much the worst response. Look at verses 18 through 20 here. Uh, look, again, keep in mind, he's just asked this, this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, why do you call me good? He said, good teacher. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. By the way, we, we talked about this in our, our Bible studies this past week. He knew the commandments. More than likely, was this man an ethical man, a, a moral man? Yes or no? He knew the commandments. He knew the scriptures. That says something about him. He was a moral person, an ethical person. But do, does morality and being ethical get you to heaven? The answer is no. Some of you kind of paused. The answer is is no. Do good 
Well, I wouldn't even use the word good here. Nobody, none of us are good. But do somewhat moral and ethical people, do they go to hell every day? The answer is yes. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Look at his answer. This is why it's not just a bad response. It's pretty much the worst response. Teacher, all of these I've kept from my youth. Yes, I know the scriptures. I know what they teach. And I want you to know, Jesus, that I've kept them all. That's about the dumbest thing you can say to Jesus, okay? A couple of things in this, in this text, in these verses. He, he says, why do you call me good? This rich young ruler said, good teacher. And Jesus answered real quickly by saying, why do you call me good? R.C. Sproul states this, that we're quick to call one another good without giving thought to what goodness actually entails. <clears throat> Excuse me. Usually we employ the term good in like a comparative way. If I say that my dog is a good dog, I don't mean that my dog has a highly refined ethical sense of propriety. I simply mean that as dogs go, she's a fairly well-behaved dog. She comes when I call her. She does not bite the mailman. She is housebroken. So compared to many dogs, she's a good dog. Real theological here, right? The same applies when we say that a person is good. We simply mean that compared with many other people, He or she is a good person. However, we dare not judge ourselves or others in relation to other human beings. Ultimately, genuine goodness is defined by the character of God. Let me tell you, we're guilty of this. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We'll we'll say, that's a good person over there. That's a good man. That's a good lady. Well, that's good. And what we're doing is we're comparing this person to the drug dealer or this person to the prostitute or this person to whatever. You fill in the blank. And we're saying that compared to that person, this person seems what? Good. But this person that we're labeling good compared to God is what? I mean, you could just say not good or bad, whatever, filthy, whatever you want to put in there. But we're so good at comparing even ourselves to others. I'm better than that person. Instead of comparing ourselves to God. And by the way, when Jesus says no one is good except God alone, and then this man continues to have the conversation with him, guess what he's basically calling Jesus? Anybody know? Calling him God. I mean, Jesus, he's a good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal? Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. Well, then the guy continues to engage with him. So by continuing the conversation after Jesus says, no one's good except God, and he just said, you're the good teacher, he's basically saying, you're who? I'm kind of slow this morning, guys. He's basically saying, "You're, you're God. Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. It's likely a substitution for do not covet in Ten Commandments. Honor your father and and mother. To keep all these commandments of God without ever breaking one, listen carefully, if you can keep all these commandments of God without ever breaking one, you don't need Jesus. If you can live a perfect life, an unblemished life, a life without any sin, you don't need forgiveness, which means you don't need Jesus. And that's what this man's basically saying. All of those I've kept since my childhood, I'm good. By the way, this was this kind of goes back to Deuteronomy 30. You don't have to turn there, but he would have known this well. He would have known this text. I know we don't stay to it or we don't know it as well today, but he would have been very familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 30. Uh, starting in verse 15, says, See, I've set before you today life and good and death and evil. I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, listen, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live 
and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless, will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of. If you just follow his ways and do what he says, follow his commands, you will live. So this guy's saying, I have followed your commands. All of them. But had he? Yes or no? Teacher, all of these I've kept from my youth. Verse 20. That's not just a bad response. It's basically the worst response. You would think he might be more humble, by the way. He started in humility. If you look at verse 17, he came and he knelt before Jesus. Look how humble I am, Jesus. Look look at me. I'm going to kneel before you. And and teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know there was a part of his his mind that was thinking Jesus was going to say, oh, brother, look at you kneeling, and look how much you know about the Scriptures, and look at you know the commandments, and look at your morality, and look, you're an ethical person. You've got it. You've got got eternal life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's what I thought. I just wanted to verify. That's how he thought the conversation was going to go. You understand that? And he gave a terrible terrible answer. He's standing before the very Son of God who knows everything about him better than he knows himself. He basically was telling Jesus, I'm good enough to enter heaven without your help. He thought he was good. Maybe compared to the beggar on the side of the road, he was good. But compared to God, He was filthy. This this young ruler basically thought he had lived a good enough life to earn his way into heaven. I deserve it. And I really still see this today. There are people today that believe that if their good outweighs their bad, that they will go to heaven. If I just do more good things today than bad things today, God will Accept me. Of course, the the problem with even saying this is, have you done more good things today than bad things? The the real theological answer is no. In your life, have you done more good things in your life than bad things? The real theological answer is absolutely not. Your sin far outweighs the good that you've done. Do you know this? Do you accept this? Can Can you bear that? Can you take that in that... Your sinfulness is so heavy, it separates you from God, not just for a day, not just for a week, and not just for a month, but for eternity. And this guy couldn't get that through his his head. He thought he was good enough. I'm making somebody cry. Sorry. Going back to Sproul, here's what he says. It's obvious that this man had not heard Jesus' sermon on the mount. Where Jesus explained that even if we refrain from full-orbed adultery, but have lust in our hearts, we've broken the law. And that even if we've never taken a human life, if we've been angry without cause, we've broken the law against murder. And so on. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus basically says, you've sinned. All of you. It wasn't. Just a bad response. It was actually a pretty just terrible, it's the worst response. Third and, and finally t- today, I would say this. It's not just a bad decision. It's an eternally tragic decision. Verses 21 and 22. And Jesus, looking at him, he loved him. Even with his bad answer, by the way. Even with his sinfulness. Even with his filth, he, he loved him. And he said, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. By the way, can somebody sell all that they have and give it to the poor and still miss out on heaven? Yeah. We talked about this several times this past week with the kids. It's kind of confusing because, I mean, especially when you're talking to a teenager, because it says right here, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. So somebody could actually misinterpret that and say, well, I'll tell you what, if I want heaven, I just got to, I can work for it. I can sell all that I have and give it to the poor, and I'm good to go. It's not why Jesus said this, right? Not why 
He said it. Let me go back to this real quick. Jesus looked at him and what? What does it, it say in the text? He what him? He loved him. I would ask you this. I mean, who are we trying to fool? You know, if you've prioritized anything above the Lord, who are you trying to fool? Me? Well, congratulations. I'm pretty gullible. You can fool me, okay? You can fool me. You win. I don't care. But when you're standing before Jesus and you're telling him that you've kept all the commandments and you've done everything, you're not going to fool him. Jesus knew this man's sinfulness and he knows ours. I want you to hear this though, that how does Jesus respond to our sinful condition? He looks at us and he what? And he loves us. In this man's sinfulness, standing right before him, it says he looked at him and he loved him. In your sinfulness, right now, Jesus looks at you and he what? And he loves you. I mean, he was next to someone on the cross who really was a criminal and really had sinned. Yet he looked at him and he loved him. And he said, today, you'll be with me where? In paradise, yeah, in glory, in heaven. And I, I heard Alistair Begg preach on this, on this text where the, the thief was next to Jesus on the cross. And I love this because we think there's all these things that you have to know and that you have to, have to learn. The thief on the cross, if I had asked that thief moments before he took his last breath, tell me all you know about baptism, what would he have said? Very little. <laughs> tell me what you know about ecclesiology, the study of the church. What do you know? Tell me right now. What do you know about eschatology, the study of end times? Tell me right now. He wouldn't even know the word. Tell me all the doctrine that you know right now. Tell it to me. Let me see if you're good enough to go to heaven. Let me see. What would that, what would that, that thief on the cross, what would he have said? You see, we put all these mental barriers up that I've got to know this and I've got to know that and I'm not smart enough and I don't get it. I don't, let me tell you what that thief on the cross knew. You can need to... Alistair Begg, man, when he, when he throws this out there, he kind of he gives this story about when the, the thief on the cross gets to heaven, and they say, they say, hey, why should we let you in? You know, and they, they start asking him theological questions, and he doesn't know any of the answers at all. And finally, the, the man at the, at the gate to get into heaven, he gets frustrated, and he says, all I know is the man in the middle said I could come. At the end of the day, do you trust Jesus? For the forgiveness of your sins. Do you trust him as the Christ? Do you believe he's the son of God, raised from the dead for the forgiveness of your sins? He looked at him and he, he loved him. By the way, as they're nailing him to the cross, what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. By the way, this man had broken the very first commandment in the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. What had become this man's God? His wealth. He found his peace in money. He found his security in money. His identity was probably wrapped up that he was the rich young ruler. He loved his money. I'm guessing he had never murdered probably never physically committed adultery. Maybe he had never stolen anything. But he placed money before God. In the same scripture, by the way, in Deuteronomy, that he likely used to justify his own salvation, I'll take you back there, Deuteronomy 30. So after it talks about, if you keep the statutes, if you keep my commandments, you will, you will live. It goes on to say, but if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods, what god was he worshiping? Money. And serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. So it's interesting that more than likely the very same text that he was using to justify his salvation, if he had just kept reading, and if he had evaluated his own life, he would have come to the conclusion that money was his god. He wasn't following the commands of the Lord. This has been said before. I believe it's true. 
Salvation is the free gift of God. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't work hard enough for it. You just have to receive it. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who's come into the world to save us from our sins, risen from the dead. If you can say that with all of your heart and put your life behind him, you're saved. Salvation is the free gift of God, but it will cost you everything. Jesus is not Lord over some of your life. He must be Lord over all of your life. A text that we need to consider before we close. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? I think it's my responsibility as your pastor to really make you contemplate this. You could be the rich young ruler and have everything on earth but totally miss out on eternity. And how foolish would that be? Some of the students asked us this past week, so if I say yes to Jesus this week, that means i got to sell everything. Is that what that means? And I think the truth is this. Jesus doesn't ask all of us to sell everything that we have, but we've got to be willing to. You've got to be willing to. How do we inherit eternal life? I want to show you something in the text real fast before we go. There's no doubt that Mark does this on purpose. Uh, what story is right before the rich young man, rich young ruler? Look in your Bible. What story is right before it? I mean the, immediately before it. Let the what come to me. Let the children come to me. Mark does this absolutely with intention. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked him. But Jesus saw it and was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Listen, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He's looking at children who have no money and limited knowledge, and he's saying to such belongs the kingdom of God. They've got childlike faith. They just believe me, and they trust me. Their faith is in me. They can't fully explain it. They just believe me, and they follow me. And then you've got the rich young ruler who's got knowledge and he's got money, everything the world can offer, but misses out. There's a comparison here between the children who just have childlike faith and the ruler who believes he's good enough, but he's not. I want to ask you this, this morning before we close in prayer here. Which one are you more similar to? Are you like this rich young man, trusting in your own knowledge and your own money? Or are you more like the children who just come to Jesus in faith? You, you don't fully get it. You don't fully can't explain it like a PhD theologian, but you know that Jesus is the Christ. You know that He's the Son of God crucified, buried, risen, all for your salvation, all for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can have a right relationship with God and you can have eternal life. Childlike faith. Which one are you? Let's pray. Father, remind us this morning that, that all of us in this, this country are are wealthy compared to the nations around us. Remind us that it's so easy to trust in our own knowledge, our own power, our own wealth, that sometimes we even trust our own wealth more than we trust you. We believe in money more than we believe in you. And that's what this guy struggled with. It was an idol. He placed it above you. God, help us to be willing to sacrifice it all 
to give it all away to follow you. I pray that we would have childlike faith, just trusting Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. None of us are worthy. No, not one. We've all fallen short. Father, we give you praise for the seven who made professions of faith this past week. And they, they went from death to life, eternal life. Pray that maybe somebody would do that today. And we lift this up in Jesus' name.